morning, Redeemer. Let's stand to our feet. Let's worship together this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my team. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my too Till I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness your glorious day. Come on, we're thankful for His mercy this morning. Sing it out. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old thing Jesus, when I met you, oh, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name. I needed a rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. song this morning all about the faithfulness of God. He's a promise making and a promise keeping God and we want to praise him for that this morning. So just as you learn this, let's worship together. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness to me from 
the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me oh you are faithful oh oh through it all you are good God, from age to age, that the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Oh, your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. Oh, He'll never let me down. Great is your faith. through it all, through every trial, through every storm. He is faithful. We praise him for that this morning. You can go ahead and have a seat. And as you do, just want to welcome you to Redeemer this morning. We are so glad that you're here, uh, so excited to be able to gather together to worship, whether you're here in person, you're joining us online, just glad that we can be together and worship the Lord together today. And so uh, really glad you're here. Something we do every week uh, is fill out that register. And so grab your phones. Uh, you can go to redeemerbible.church slash register or go on the app under the Sunday morning tab. You'll see the register right there and uh, fill that out. Let us know you're here. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Uh, this truly is a way that helps us care for each other uh, to know what's going on, how we can love and care for each other. And so just take a minute or two and fill that out. That would be super helpful. Uh, while you're online or on the app, you can also give uh, there. If you want to do that in person, there's some uh, offering boxes uh, that you can drop uh, and, uh, a check in as you leave or cash or whatever that is. But we want to worship the Lord through giving too. So we just encourage you to do that. Uh, I have a question for you. How many of you have decorated for Christmas already? Yeah. Uh, okay, so a couple of us. We did earlier than usual because 2020. 
We're like, we need Christmas in the house. <laughs> a little joy. And so we have decorated. We're so excited for Christmas. And we're excited to be able to celebrate that together on Christmas Eve. And so Christmas Eve, we're going to have two services, a 3.30 and a 5 o'clock excited to gather together, but we would ask this. You would go online. You can do that starting today. Uh, you can go on the website. You can do it through the app. Um, RSVP for these Christmas Eve services. We want to try as best we can um, to be able to stay distanced how we need to, and so those RSVPs are going to be really helpful for us. And so please take some time. Let us know what service you're coming to. Um, man, I hope both those are full, and maybe... We'll add a third service if we can fill them up. So we would love that. But but go ahead and please RSVP uh, for those. That would be super helpful. 3.30 and 5. We're looking forward to, after the year that it has been, being able to gather together as we close the year and just fix our eyes on Jesus, the one who became flesh, became man, lived the perfect life that you and I could never live, died the death that we deserved, and then rose again so that we could have hope in any and every situation. Even 2020, we can have hope because of Jesus and him alone. And so we want to celebrate that together. As we continue to worship, I just want to read from uh, God's word this morning. Psalm 46 says this, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. God is our what? Refuge. God is our refuge and what? Strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. God is our refuge, and he's our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. You know, sometimes familiar passages like this, we just fly through them, and sometimes we need to repeat them over and over to let the truth settle into our souls that God is my refuge, that God is my strength, that he is very present to help in times of trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. God is my refuge and strength. I want to read this excerpt from a site called The Worship Initiative. It says this, The faithfulness of God often feels the sweetest when he fills a hole left by loss. God is ever present, but his presence suddenly feels more real, even tangible when trials come. Notice the psalmist says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Not just present, but very present, especially present, lovingly present, relentlessly present. When the earth beneath us begins to give way, he draws even nearer. Trouble and loss are opportunities to press into the presence of God, to deepen our confidence in his faithfulness, and to prepare ourselves for endless days without trouble and loss. And for all of us in one way or another, 2020 has been a year of some sort of trouble and loss. But this morning, God is here ready to be a very present help, ready to draw near, to be your refuge, to be your strength this morning. And so let's turn our hearts, let's turn our attention, our affection to him as he draws near to us. Let's not miss his healing presence as he's here with us this morning. And so I want to give us some time to pray, just you and the Lord. I'm going to leave about a minute or two of silence. And by a minute or two, I mean a minute or two. So I'm going to give you some time to pray and just seek the Lord. Maybe use this passage as a way to pray. Just surrender to God. Maybe there's some things that God is beginning to convict you of. However God is leading, let's spend some time praying and not missing the fact that he is inviting us into his refuge, into his safety, into his strength, into his presence this morning. And so spend some time between you and the Lord. Let's pray. Let's seek him together. And then we'll continue in worship this morning.
Father, even as I just pray over this psalm, I think of the, the image of refuge and strength. And, and the fact is, the reality is that a good refuge brings strength and brings courage. And God, you are a good and strong and perfect refuge. And when we hide ourselves in you, when we rest in you, God, you bring strength, you bring courage, you bring boldness, you bring grace, you bring mercy, you bring justice that has been satisfied by Jesus. God, you bring that all to us as we hide ourselves in Christ, in you and you alone as our perfect refuge. And so, God, we come back to you this morning. We realize, we recognize, God, that we so quickly turn away. And this morning, we are coming back to you. We want to experience you as a refuge and strength, as our perfect refuge, which brings strength. And we want to experience your very present help, your very present nearness this morning as we continue to sing, as we continue to worship you, as we open your word. God, as we gather here in person, on a screen, we want you to be working and moving, God. And so we just surrender to you. We ask you to open up our hearts to receive from you this morning. And so God, do that for your glory, for your honor, and for your name. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. In this I hold, my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoice For in my need His power is displayed To this I hope My Savior will defend Day by 
the King of kings, O oh God, forever we will sing. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign forever. set our eyes on the Lamb, your holy name, Jesus. And even just as we were, as we were singing that, I, I just sensed your spirit just saying, we all have certain responses to certain names. I, I, could, I could start rattling off some names, and some of us, in light of a certain name, would feel maybe excitement or, or hope or, or fear, or maybe a, another name brings dread or sorrow or worry. Or God, there's ways we respond to names. I pray, God, that as we, as we sing about your holy name, that we would respond appropriately with, with great fear, great comfort, great awe, great wonder at the holy name of Jesus, the one who reigns and rules now and forevermore. The name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. The name at which heaven, even now as we sing, is crying out, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and wealth and wisdom and power. It's that name, God, that we gather under. It's that name that we find strength in. It's that name that brings us together this morning, God. Would we find the right comfort, would we respond the right way to the holy name of Jesus? We don't just want to be calloused to it, God. And so even now, as your, as your word is preached, would you just kind of remove some of those calluses? Would you be like a surgeon who just begins to work on our hearts in the exact way that we need this morning so that we leave here more uh, passionate about the holy name of Jesus, more in awe of the holy name of Jesus, and more ready to respond when you, Jesus, call us to act. And so, God, work in that way. Be glorified in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, grab a seat, and as you do, get a Bible in front of you to Genesis chapter 13. We are in part two of a four-part series uh, just making our way through the first book of the Bible here from Labor Day all the way to Easter. So uh, we're in part two. And I would just remind us, um, understanding Genesis has serious, like, important implications in our life. Um, uh, I think a right understanding of the book of Genesis helps us answer some of life's biggest questions. Things like, where did we come from? And who are we to be? Why are we here where did our faith in a Savior even begin in the first place? And so uh, let me just catch us up on the first uh, 12 chapters that we've been through and how we found answers to those questions already. Uh, where did we come from? Uh, we are people who have been created. And we are people who have been created by a Creator. And this Creator of the universe is the one who is to receive, as DJ was just praying, all glory and all honor and all praise. And He is the one who made us. The same one who put the stars in the heavens has knit us together. This is where we came from. And it has 
deep implications. It tells us who we are to be. We are to be people because we are His image bearers. We are to bear that image. We are made in the image of God to bear that image of God. And that tells us why we are here. We are here to see His image spread across the globe. We want the image of God spread across the globe. And this happens when we as people who have followed Jesus are filled and indwelt with a Spirit and we take the good news of the Gospel of Jesus across the globe as Christ is formed more fully in our own heart over time on this earth and we are seeing Christ formed more fully in other people's lives. And then, then, then this gets to where did our faith even originate in the first place? This faith in a Savior. You don't have to wait till the New Testament to understand that the Bible teaches this redemptive story that all of us need a Savior. In fact, what we are going to find even in the 14th chapter of the very first book of the Bible is a clear marker that points to a Savior who is going to come. And so uh, throughout part two of Genesis, we're really following the life of one man, a man named Abraham. And um, I I just want to kind of recap what we've seen about Abraham. On the heels of uh, the scene at Babel, a group of people building a city and building a tower so they could stay and make a name for themselves, God comes down and he literally sets it into chaos. And he scatters the people across the globe. In Genesis chapter 12, we find a a bold call of faith that God gives to Abram. And he says, I want you to leave what you know and who you know and where you know. And I want you to go to a place that you don't know. And Abram, with full faith, he believes God. He takes God at his word and he leaves. And he comes down into the area that will be the promised land. And a famine comes into the land. And Abram has to flee to Egypt for refuge from the famine. Uh, In Genesis 13 today, we pick up Abram now going back north to resettle into what will be the promised land. And uh, so I'm calling today's message this, Maps, Messes, and Melchizedek. Maps, Messes, and Melchizedek. And I hope by the end those things make sense to you. Maps, Messes, and Melchizedek. What I hope to do today is move us through two chapters in the book of Genesis, Genesis 13 and 14. And uh, I want to move the story along. I want us to use maps to see where Abram is settling. I want us to look at two big messes that happen along the way. But then I'm going to spend most of my time at the end of chapter 14 looking at this mysterious man named Melchizedek. And now when we get to the end of Genesis 14, Um, we really, like, there's really not that much said about this guy named Melchizedek. He is a very, very mysterious figure in some ways in the book of Genesis. But it's really important that we have the best understanding of him that we possibly can because he's mentioned again in the book of Psalms and he's mentioned again in the book of Hebrews. And in fact, Hebrews will tell us we come to a, a greater understanding of who Christ is when we understand who Melchizedek was. And so it's important for us to take our time and I want us to understand who Melchizedek is and I want us to understand why in the world knowing more about this priest and king who lived thousands of years ago gives us an understanding for a priest and king that all of our hearts in this room need to know here today. And so, um, listen, uh, today y'all, we're in a Bible study. You ready to do a little Bible study together? We got a lot of information coming out. You got a lot of names about to come out. You got a lot of places to come after. So come on. Are you ready for a Bible study? Let's study our Bibles together and let's pray and ask God's help. Lord, help us. A lot of information here in these two chapters today. We need your help and we need the the help of your spirit, God, uh, to burn into our hearts the things that you want burned deeply into our heart today. Give us understanding. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 13, verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there it says Abram does something. There what does Abram do? There Abram called upon the name of the Lord. I just want to call a timeout right here, and I want you to look at something early on as we're 
kind of early on in studying the life of Abram. I want you to notice that everywhere Abram goes, he worships. It'll say over and over again, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And there Abram built an altar. An altar. And there Abram worshiped the Lord. And just kind of this time out, a side reminder to us that as God's people, we are always to be worshiping in our going. Everywhere we go, we're worshiping. Uh, worship isn't something we just come to church to sing songs and do. But when we leave here today and when we eat lunch, when we gather as a family, as we rest in our living rooms, we do so out of a heart of worship. As some of us will get up tomorrow and maybe go back to a job, we do so with a heart of worship. As some of us gather around a table with family uh, this, this Thursday, will you look around and will you worship? As some of us, because of the reality of 2020, won't gather around a table for Thanksgiving. Can, can you find a way to worship in the midst of this because of God's faithfulness even in the midst of that? As God's people, we are always to be worshiping in our going. And we're going to see it over and over and over again. Okay, verse 5. And Lot, who was Abram's nephew, and Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. And so uh, let's get our kind of geographical bearings. Um, Abram, Lot, they've come out of Egypt. They've gone up through the Negev. The Negev is just a region kind of south and west of the Dead Sea. Uh, from the Negev, they've continued north and they've settled where it says where Abram came down and settled in the first place between uh, Bethel and between Ai. And so this is where they are at. We're uh, kind of just west of the Dead Sea, a little north and just west of the Dead uh, Sea right now. And I want you to see um, Abram's character here and how he sorts out. They get into this area and they're like, there's not enough grass here for all of your cattle to eat and for all of my cattle to eat. And I want you to look at Abram's character here as they solve this. Verse 8. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. We're family. Let's not have our people fighting over this. It's not the whole land before you. Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So we get some foreshadowing here. Something bad's going to happen to some of these cities down in the valley. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east, thus, thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. And so um, Lot and Abram, they're between Bethel and Ai, and uh, Abram says, listen, here's the deal. Uh, take your pick, wherever you want to go. You go settle. You and your family go settle over there. I'll go the opposite way. We'll each have our own areas. It says Lot lifts up his eyes and he looks down and, and this is what he would have seen. This is a picture of the Jordan River Valley. Um, uh, in 2014, I was standing at the side of ancient Ai and I lifted up my eyes and you can look down into the Jordan River Valley and you can go, I get it. He looked down and it was green and it was lush. And Lot says, I think I'll go that way. But what Lot doesn't understand, as the saying goes, not all that glitters is gold, or in this case, not all that is green is good. Because um, as he comes close to settling in Sodom, there's going to be some deep, deep implications and some consequences uh, because God's going to judge that area. But nevertheless, Abram, or, uh, Lot goes down, settles in the Jordan River Valley. Abram stays and settles in this land of Canaan. And God is going to meet with Abram. And God's going to reinforce these promises that he keeps making to him. Verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if you can count 
the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there, there he is again, there he built an altar to the Lord. Again, these promises that God keeps making to a man who doesn't even have a son yet. Uh, your descendants will be uh, too numerous to count. Look around. All that you see, as far north as you can look, as far south, as far east, as far west, this land will be yours. God's reinforcing these promises that He has made, that He will make Him into a great nation, that His descendants will be numerous, that He will have land, and He will be a blessing to all the people. And He reinforces this. Abram moves down just now a little bit south, and he settles here uh, at the, what's called the Oaks of Mamre in a place called Hebron. And now, um, Genesis 14, it kind of uh, hang with the illustration here. It's like the camera moves us from Abram settling in at this place with the reaffirmation of the promises of God. And the camera now pans down into the Jordan River Valley. And um, the beginning of Genesis 14 is filled with a ton of names of kings and a ton of names of towns. And as you read just those first seven verses there, you're just bombarded with names and towns, names and towns, names and towns, names and towns. Um, here's what you need to know about what the camera is panning down to zoom into. We are, uh, we are going to focus now into a war zone, a conflict zone. And, and we're going to be told about 12 verses in why this regional war and conflict zone impacts Abram's life and how Abram is going to intervene in it. But let me just summarize what the conflict was that we get into here in Genesis 14. A, a pastor scholar named Kent Hughes, here's how he summarizes it. He says this, Sodom was part of a pentopolis. A group of five cities, each with a petty king. Well, he'll get to what he means by that. Uh, these five cities were located at the southern end of the Dead Sea, which had been paying tribute. These five cities had been paying tribute for 12 years to a coalition of four kings to the east. Okay? So these five cities in the Jordan River Valley, south end of the Dead Sea, they all have kings over them, but they're not really kings. These kings serve under a coalition to the east of four kings headed up by a king named, ready for this, Keterleomer. He was kind of the, the head honcho over it all. Well, there comes a point after 12 years where these five cities in the Jordan River Valley are like, enough is enough. We're done paying tribute to this guy. We're off on our own. We're cutting off ties. Well, the four kings to the east don't like that at much. And they come in and invade these five towns in the Jordan River Valley. And we see how the war goes. Pick it up with me in verse 8. Uh, Genesis 14, verse 8. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out. And they joined battle in the valley of Siddim. So we're just south of the Dead Sea, kind of the Dead Sea Valley. Um, with Keterleomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was, filled, uh, was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. Who had just settled down near Sodom? Lot. Thus, Unki Abraham to the rescue. Verse 12, They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and went their way. Then one who escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshel, and of honor. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he said, oh no, they didn't. 
When Abram learned that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went and pursued as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Haba, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. And so Uncle Abraham, he hears, hey man, they, these four kings, they came over and they wiped us out. And guess what? They have your nephew Lot. And Abram's like, it's war. He gets his 318 trained men. He goes, he attacks these four foreign kings and they win. Not because of the awesomeness of 318 men, because the God, the living God of the universe is with them. And they overtake, and Abram to the rescue, he restores all the people, he restores all the possessions that are taken, and then we get this very interesting post-war scene here, where we are introduced in the Bible for the first time to this mysterious man named Melchizedek. Look at what happens, verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Keterleomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava. That is the king's valley. Now that makes sense. We go like, okay, I get that. Uh, Abram came to the rescue. He rescues Sodom. He restores all their things. It makes sense now that the king of Sodom is going to come and say, Thank you. But there's another king in the picture here. Verse 18, and Melchizedek. Who's that? Well, we're told he's king of Salem. Where's that? And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. What? Where did he come from? Who is he? Why have we not heard for 12 chapters thus far about this priest of God Most High? Who in the world is this guy? Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. Can you get there? Like, just, I mean, a little bit. Like, There's just been this war, and the king of Sodom's coming, and then there's this other king who's just there with bread and wine. He's setting it up. There's going to be like this worshipful scene that happens here. Who is this? And he, Verse 19, And he blessed him. He blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So Abram takes all that they have here and he separates a tenth of it and he gives it to this man who is called King of Salem and Priest of God Most High, a priest king. So, who is this guy? What do we know about who he is? Um, if you're a note taker, just maybe jot down a couple things, bullet list, as I say these things. Um, Melchizedek's name means this, King of Righteousness. King of Righteousness. We are told, we, we know that Melchizedek is actually a descendant of Ham. Now, who is Ham? Very good. One of, jo one of Noah's son. Not one of Jonah's son. One of Noah's son. Uh, they both interacted with water. Um, one, of, one of Noah's sons. So uh, Noah had three sons on the ark with him. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We are following the line of Shem as we've been studying Abram. Melchizedek is a descendant from Ham. Ham's actually the one that was cursed. He's the cursed be Canaan, the son of Ham. Melchizedek is this Canaanite king. But what we can tell is Melchizedek has actually kept his heart in a place where he understands there is one true God, creator of heaven and earth, and his heart has been set aside to honor this true God in such a way that God calls him a priest of God most high. Um, remember the town that he is king of. What town is he king of? Salem. Where, where is Salem? Uh, Salem is actually ancient Jerusalem. He is king of what will become the city of God. 
And so God in his sovereignty has this descendant from the line of Ham who is, seems the best we can tell, kept his heart in a place of honoring the one true God in such a way that God in his sovereignty has led, um, let him be king over this ancient city that will grow into becoming Jerusalem and he's called priest of God Most High. So Melchizedek is a priest king. Why does this matter? Psalm 110 helps us, gives us like another clue. Okay, so now we are on a biblical clue hunt, okay? From Genesis to Psalms. You know, all the Bible's connected. It's awesome. It's the greatest story history has ever seen. It's why it's the best-selling book ever. If you haven't read it, you've got to read the Bible. It's amazing. Psalm 110 says this. This is a psalm about the the Messiah King who will come from the line of David. David, by the way, also a king sitting in Jerusalem. The Lord has sworn and will not change His mind. And now about this Messiah King who will come from the line of David. You are a priest forever after the order of... I know no one wants to say it right. It's Melchizedek. So you're a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, this mysterious priest king we meet in Genesis 14, we're now to the book of Psalms where it says the Messiah king, the Savior king who comes from David comes in the order of Melchizedek. And now keep going, keep going. Hebrews chapter 7. We see it again. Another mention of this mysterious Melchizedek. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest not of the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who is Hebrews 7 talking about? Jesus. Okay, when you're in church, it's either the Bible or Jesus. or the, It's Jesus. Hebrews 7 is talking about Jesus. So, priest king. 14 chapters into the Bible, pointing to a priest king who will come from the line of David. Hebrews kind of wraps it all up for it and puts a bow on top to tell us, and do you want to know who the priest in the order of Melchizedek is who comes in the line of David? His name is Jesus. Why? You're like, cool. Fun little like Bible trivia, what in the world doesn't matter for us now sitting here thousands of years later? Here's why it matters. Throughout the Old Testament, you see three primary offices amongst God's people. The prophets, the priests, and the kings. The prophets had a job. Your job is to be the mouthpiece of God. The prophets were to do this. Thus says the Lord. The prophets were just supposed to be faithful to say, here's what God said and I'm just telling you it. The false prophets didn't do that. The good prophets did that. And throughout our Bible, we have a whole section of our Bible that's about the prophets. And thus says the Lord. The priests were to be the mediator for God. A a mediator meets between two parties and tries to bring a reconciling agreement. The priests throughout the Old Testament were mediating between broken, sinful people and a holy and perfect God through the sacrificial system, through the atonement of blood of a sacrificial animal. The kings were the monarchs for God. They were to be wholeheartedly devoted to follow the king of kings. And they were to lead the people in the following after God as well. Israel's history is littered with a few good kings and a whole lot of bad kings. The good kings, their hearts were wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord. The bad kings, their hearts were divided and they were not. And so the Old Testament... All through the Bible, we see the prophets and we see the priests and we see the kings. As we get into the New Testament, and as we especially look in the book of Hebrews, here's what we find. 
that we desperately need a perfect prophet. And we desperately need a perfect priest. And we desperately need a perfect king. And all throughout all of the history, there's been no perfect prophets, no perfect priests, no perfect kings. Enter Jesus who fulfills all three offices as our perfect prophet, the perfect high priest, and the perfect king of kings. What this means is that Jesus is the priest king, and I would add, in the order of Melchizedek, who mediates on my behalf before God. Me and my brokenness, mediated by a perfect Savior into the presence and relationship with the Holy God. He mediates on my half before God and He leads my heart back to a right place with God as my King. Jesus is the perfect priest King all of us in this room need. The only priest King who can mediate us rightly back to a relationship with God, the only priest king who is to be the king of our heart, leading us in the way we are to go. Fourteen chapters into the Bible, God introduces us to a priest king so that our hearts would begin to yearn for the greater priest king who would one day come. That's how Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And here's why it matters. And let me frame it in a question. Have you surrendered to Jesus as your priest king? Or are you still rejecting Jesus as your priest king? If you're in the room today and you have never come to a point in your life where you have saw, where you have looked at your own heart and you have seen your sin, And you have understood that God, your Creator, is holy and perfect. And that there's this great chasm between you and your brokenness and God and His holiness. And if you've never understood that this is why Jesus came down to be the mediating bridge between you and your brokenness and God and His holiness. If you've never understood that you are not to be the king of your own life. But that God sent His Son so that He can sit as the king of your life then today is the day for you to literally right there in your seat just say, Jesus, I surrender to your priesthood and I surrender to your kingship and I long to follow you. For every unbeliever in the room, this is the assignment you're left to wrestle with. Will you surrender to this one who's come to mediate a way back to God and to be the king leading the rest of your days? For the believers in the room, I would just look at this and go, okay, what is the implication that we find a priest king in Genesis 14 pointing us all the way to the perfect priest king at the end of the Bible? I I, I want to kind of parse this out for every believer in the room and say, let's talk about what it means that Jesus is our perfect priest. If he has mediated for us, if he has intervened, and through His blood shed on the cross and then being laid in a tomb and then rising victoriously, if His death on the cross has satisfied the penalty of our sin and we have put our faith in Him, are you resting in the mediating power of this priest, this great high priest that you have? Or are you still practically living like your good has to outweigh your bad? I know you know theologically that's not true, but are you still practically living like a great high priest hasn't come and mediated at all on your behalf? There's too many professing Christians too worn out because you're trying to mediate your own way back to a holy God. And theologically you might get it, but practically you're still trying to run this rat race like Maybe he'll accept me now. Maybe he'll accept me now. Maybe he'll accept me now. He accepts you because a great high priest mediated on your behalf. Period. Period. Will you rest in the mediating power of your great high priest? And if he's king, are we letting him be king? Like if he is really king, 
I got to look at my own life and say, do I really live like he's king? When I know he has called me to do something, is my response, yes, master. Yes, your, your honor. Whatever you say. When out of his love for me, he calls me away from my sin that I love to go back into, are we, are we running from it because we look at it and his kingship is so good. We just want to live a life to honor the king. If he's our priest and he's our king, would we rest in his priesthood and would we run after his kingship and would we allow him to be the great priest king that scripture tells us he is? Amen. So church, just stand to your feet and we're going to worship our way out of here. I just want to remind us all through the scriptures. Every scripture we encounter points us to Jesus Christ. 14 chapters in, we're introduced to a priest king so that our eyes will lift up and look to the greater priest king we're introduced to at the end of the story and the one who's to lead our lives currently. Father, I just pray for us today as your people I pray for any heart in here right now who, Lord, through this Old Testament passage might be going, I'm still wrestling with what does this mean? Lord, would you give them courage and boldness to ask questions to someone they came with or to come up front here and talk and ask more questions about how they can know that they know you as their Savior? God, I pray for every heart in here who does know you that they would rest in the mediating power of your great high priesthood and they would follow wholeheartedly the authority of your great kingship. Because, Lord, there is no one that's higher. There is no other great high priest we're looking for. There is no other king that our heart needs but you, Jesus. Have your way in our hearts today. And as we sing these words with our lips to close a church service, would they reflect the attitude of our heart as we walk out to live our lives this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our Savior has died, the Lord of life. Can't be contained, our God has risen from the grave. Oh, our God has risen from the grave. Behold the Lamb. Redeemer, you are loved and you are sent. Have a great week.